Hello everyone, welcome to this look around Blenheim Palace for this month's Patreon and I visited a month or so ago to record a podcast interview with social historian there, Antonia Keeney. That podcast is available to you already, so please uh, go back through the posts and have a look. That podcast was specifically about Sarah Churchill, the first Duchess of Marlborough, effectively the builder of this amazing palace. But while I was there, of course, I took lots of pictures and I want to share those with you today with a bit of the story of Blenheim Palace. So let's get on with today's look around Blenheim Palace. Visitors today enter through the East Gate. It's easy to park at Blenheim if you are wanting to make a visit, but it's quite a long walk down the drive and you come to, like I said, the East Gate here into one of the outer courts, which was originally a kitchen court. You go through and then enter the Great Court with this amazing vista of Blenheim. But before we go into the palace, I want to first draw your attention to the plaque above the East Gate, which every visitor now to the palace comes in uh, underneath, because it actually gives a lot of information about the origins of this palace. It says, and we won't get close enough to be able to read it, but I will, I will let you know what it says. It says, under the auspices of a munificent sovereign, this house was built for John, Duke of Marlborough, and his Duchess Sarah by Sir J. Vanborough between the years 1705 and 1722. And this royal manor of Woodstock, together with a grant of £240,000 towards the building of Blenheim, was given by Her Majesty Queen Anne and confirmed by Act of Parliament. To the said John, Duke of Marlborough, and to all his issue, male and female line ally descending. So we're going to take a walk around Blenheim Palace, as it is today, open to visitors. And as we go around, I'm going to tell you some of the history of the palace. We'll begin in the Great Hall. As the useful inscription above the East Gate tells us, Blenheim was begun in 1705. However, it's never actually been finished, or not at least to the plans originally created for it by Vanborough. But that didn't stop George III exclaiming on a visit here, we have nothing to equal this. The Royal Park of Woodstock had been granted, given as a present from Queen Anne on behalf of a grateful nation to Sir John Churchill, first Duke of Marlborough, who had led the Allied troops to victory at the Battle of Blenheim in 1704. So this was given away quite quickly. This, the building began in 1705 and the Crown, the taxpayer actually, had given £240,000 toward the building. Um, in the end, the Marlboroughs spent another £60,000 themselves on the building. In today's money, so a total of £300,000 would equate to something like £25 million. The ceiling of the Great Hall is 20 metres high or 67 foot and the painting done in 1716 is by Sir James Thornhill and it depicts the victorious first Duke of Marlborough. He's in Roman dress and he's kneeling as he presents his plan for the Battle of Blenheim to Britannia. As we head up the North Corridor, we are immediately into the story of another famous person who is linked to Blenheim, 
and that is Sir Winston Churchill, who famously said, said, at Blenheim I took two very important decisions, to be born and to marry, and indeed he had been born here, and the room in which he was born uh, is open and you are able to visit. His mother had been here at a party, uh, set uh, given by his grandparents and went into labour earlier than expected. Blenheim is extremely proud of its links to our wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill and they have an exhibition permanently with artefacts from when he was in office. They also have his curls that were cut off when he was younger and artwork that he, he was a painter and, uh, and he, there's a painting of his of Blenheim Lake in the exhibition too. Before we leave to go and look at the State Apartments, I want to show you this famous portrait of the Marlborough family. On the left is Sir John Churchill, the first Duke. In the middle is Sarah Churchill, the first Duchess. And this was created by John Klosterman in 1697 and it shows them with five surviving children, four daughters and a son. The son was given the title first Marquis of Blanford but he died of smallpox at the age of 17. That left the Marlboroughs with no heir. But after the first Duke's death in 1722 an earlier extraordinary act of Parliament had been passed which allowed the title to pass to his eldest daughter Henrietta and she became the second Duchess of Marlborough in her own right. When she died in 1733 the third Duke became her nephew Charles who is the daughter of her sister Anne Spencer Countess of Sunderland who's wearing red in this painting. This is the first of the drawing rooms it's called the green drawing room and on account of it does have this overall tone of green and the wallpaper is green um, but the ceiling is a Hawksmoor ceiling Hawksmoor famous for also working with Sir Christopher Wren Next we enter the red drawing room and in here there are many portraits of the Marlborough family through the generations and many of them feature a spaniel they're known as the Blenheim Spaniels and there's a story that goes like this that Sarah Churchill as she was waiting on news for of the Battle of Blenheim that she had a pregnant bitch on her lap and she would she was stroking this dog when the puppies came each of them had a mark on their head corresponding to where Sarah had stroked the mother dog and this story of the Blenheim spot was born. The second wife of the ninth duke whose pit portrait we're looking at here bred these dogs but she kept them in cages in the great hall which was not something the duke was best pleased about apparently. This is the saloon. I think it's probably my favourite room in the entire palace and in the time of the first duke this was going to be the grand reception room. It's now used as a dining room, believe it or not, the family uses this on Christmas Day. Amazing. Um, the, it's got another amazing ceiling. Originally, Sir James Thornhill, whose work we saw in the, uh, the Great Hall, was commissioned for the ceiling. However, he and Sarah Churchill had a falling out about money which is not unusual in the story of Sarah Churchill. And so the work you see here was done by a French artist called Louis Laguerre. In the 20th century, the diarist James Lee Milne observed that this room could vie with the most splendid palace rooms in Europe. I think he's probably right. Here in the first state room, hangs a number of tapestries from the Marlborough tapestries. These are a series known as the Victories series which were commissioned by the first Duke. But also in this room there is a copy of the dispatch that he sent to his wife Sarah to tell her of the victory. It sits on top of this red stained amazing tortoiseshell writing desk 
and it's written on the back of a tavern bill, the only piece of paper he had to hand. In it he says to his wife, please give my duty to the Queen and let her know her army has had a glorious victory. Behind this dispatch and to the left of the fireplace you'll see a flag with three fleur-de-lis. This is a very special flag, it's called a quit rent standard and when Queen Anne gifted the royal uh, land of Woodstock to the Duke of Marlborough in 1704 a quit rent standard was presented to her. Now a new version of this flag has to be created every year and taken to Windsor Castle before the anniversary of Blenheim on the 13th of August. This visit now normally takes place apparently in July but if that deadline isn't met then the family must quit and the Crown reclaims the land. In the second stateroom, we find something quite surprising, a portrait of the Sun King, Louis XIV of France, above the fireplace. When John Churchill was just simply Captain John Churchill, he served in the Royal English Regiment of the French Army. France and England were at war against the Dutch, and after the 1673 Siege of Maastricht, Louis actually personally thanked the young captain. but. By the time of the War of the Spanish Succession, which started in 1702, then the former allies were now enemies. And after Marlborough's decisive victory at Blenheim, apparently Louis would not even have the name of the battle said in front of him. And so the reason that there's a portrait of him here is simply because Marlborough beat him. The third stateroom was actually originally the state bedroom and in here it's full of French um, antiques basically from a designer called André Charles Boulle. He was a favourite of Louis XIV. Now we come to our penultimate stop on this look around Blenheim Palace and it's the Long Library. This room stretches for the entirety of the west wing of the palace. The room is thought to be the second longest room in the whole of England and it is 56 metres or 183 foot long. The statue of Queen Anne which stands at one end of the library was commissioned by Sarah Churchill Despite the fact that the one-time close friends had fallen out and they were not reconciled by the time of Anne's death, Sarah still felt grateful to Anne for the kindness and generosity that she had shown her. The Long Library had originally been designed by the overall architect of the palace, Vanborough, but by the time it was constructed, Sarah Churchill had fallen out with him. Indeed, despite begging with Sarah to let him come and see Blenheim, she never allowed him to and he died without seeing it completed. And the room was completed by Nicholas Hawksmoor. There's another example of where Sarah falls out with people here. You may notice that despite the wonderful stucco domes that were created by Isaac Mansfield, the flat ceiling panels are left blank and that is because they should have been the work of Sir James Thornhill. They should have depicted more allegorical scenes, but of course Sarah, the first Duchess, had refused to pay him already for the saloon, and so they were left undecorated. At the end of the room stands this incredible organ, which was put in by the 8th Duke and his American wife, Lily, in 1891. The Duke died only the following year and a note was found scribbled on a scrap of paper torn from the Times newspaper. It's those words that are used for the inscription above and it reads, In memory of happy days and as a tribute to this glorious home we leave thy voice to speak within these walls in years to come when hours are still. When the first Duke had died in 1722 
he left instructions in his will for him to be buried in my chapel at Blenheim House. However, the chapel hadn't been finished at that point and he was interred in Westminster Abbey. The chapel is quite plain as chapels go from this era, but that was on purpose. Sarah wanted to draw attention to this monument to her husband. For the monument, Sarah decided to depict her husband as a victorious Roman general. Their two sons are also on this monument, both of whom predeceased the couple. They are in fact both buried here, John Churchill having been reinterred with Sarah when she died in 1744. I hope you've enjoyed this look around Blenheim Palace with me. If you have any questions about the palace, the history of it or any of the interiors, then please pop them in the comments and I will do my very best to answer them. Remember to check out the podcast with Antonia Keeney about Sarah Churchill as well. I'll see you all next time. Bye for now.